Good evening, you're watching Left, Right and Center. I'm Nidhi Razdan. On the show tonight, as we get into election mode with nearly half of the voting population under the age of 35, what is it that young India wants and who do they connect with more? Narendra Modi, Rahul Gandhi or a totally different brand of politics? That will be our special focus in just a few minutes from now. But first, the big news of the day. High drama outside the UP Assembly this evening with BJP supporters led by Uma Bharti preventing the arrest of BJP MLAs against whom there are non-bailable arrest warrants regarding the Muzaffar Nagar riots. Uma Bharti in fact dared the government to take them into custody. At least three BJP MLAs who have been booked by the police actually attended the assembly today. There are also other legislators against whom arrest warrants uh, have been uh, taken out but no arrests have been made so far. Let's just first listen into what Uma Bharti said just a little while earlier. I believe that uh, today's action at the gate, if, if, if any of the MLAs are arrested, it means they want to restart the riot again and this time to please a particular community, they will attack a particular community and that is the design because without any investigation, it has been promised on the floor of the assembly and we all have given the assurance and every party has said it that without in, in, uh, investigation, there should be no action against anybody. But if they take the action, it means that there is a plan, there is a conspiracy on the mind of the government to restart the right again. And this time they want to target one particular community and one party. You demand immediate to imprisonment? I think the government should be dismissed. Now I can say it. Because what they said on the floor and what has, is happening on the gate, is a, it, it is a total 100% opposite what they said on the floor. It means this government is not reliable. This government wants to create right again. This government should be dismissed immediately. Well, joining us now from Muzaffar Nagar, my colleague Srinivasan Jain, and from Lucknow, my colleague Anand Zarane. Vasu, to you first, it's completely absurd the kind of drama that we're seeing playing out here where you have arrest warrants against these legislators, but the police are unable to arrest them. W what's the latest? Well, Nidhi, uh, one doesn't know what is more outrageous, the fact that someone like Uma Bharti will make such provocative statements even hinting at the possibility of riots at a time when you now have 41 refugee camps in Muzaffar Nagar and almost 29,000 people displaced just in this district alone or, as you pointed out, a state government that technically doesn't need warrants to arrest these politicians against whom there are already serious charges but gets them anyway and then despite the fact that these politicians turn up uh, at the assembly and they're openly uh, able to get away once again in a very brazen act of defiance. Also to point out to you, Nidhi, that the other shocking example of uh, the state government's inaction is uh, Kadir Rana, the BSP MP right here from Muzaffar Nagar, who as we've been tracking for the past week is still missing. Uh, we went to his house today here and in Delhi, no sign of him. But even worse, Nidhi, no indication that the state government has made an even a basic attempt to track down Mr. Rana. Right. Uh, Anand, coming to you, what, what are the police saying about the possibilities of these arrests and why only these BJP legislators? After all, there are other legislators uh, against whom action has to be taken as well. Well, these BJP leaders essentially surfaced in the assembly today, uh, Nidhi, which is why perhaps they were the focus of, you know, these arrests. And uh, as soon as news came in that they are present in the assembly, senior police officials, the IG law and order, the ADG law and order, they also came to the assembly perhaps to work out modalities as to whether these people can be arrested because there was some amount of confusion about whether they can be arrested while the assembly is in session. Uh, also, the whole aspect of about maintaining santum sanctorum of, uh, you know, the assembly whether they can arrest them inside the assembly or whether these have to happen outside with the consent of the speaker. So these officials were present in the assembly and so were these leaders who have been booked. Two of them have uh, arrest warrants uh, against them. One of them was not there, the BJP MLA uh, Kumar uh, Bharatendra. And essentially uh, when you know these people, these MLAs started coming out of the assembly, we did get a feeling that perhaps these arrests will happen today. But the manner in which they were completely surrounded by BJP MLAs and also a large number of BJP supporters made it absolutely impossible for the police to actually step in and take charge of the situation. And they later on went to the BJP headquarters and after going to the BJP headquarters, Uma Bharti left and so did Hukum Singh and Sangeet Som who actually surfaced today for the first time after he's been booked for actually uploading a inflammatory video, a Facebook video which went viral in Muzaffar Nagar. So whether we will see similar scenes in the assembly tomorrow, well that remains to be seen. Uma Bharti is left 
for Varanasi. Sangeet Som may may not attend the assembly tomorrow. So is this a missed opportunity for the UP police, or whether perhaps there was a conscious decision? Because clearly Uma Bharti was, as Vasu pointed out earlier, that in referring to fact that riots could happen or could flare up, you know, and hinting to the possibility of that. So perhaps right. uh, a sense of caution also creeping in in the minds of the UP police uh, before actually going ahead and making these arrests. All right, Anand and Vasu, thanks very much for that update there. Uh, never a dull day uh, there in Uttar Pradesh. Well, moving on to our special focus tonight. 47% of voters in the next general election will be under the age of 35. And that is why, like never before, political parties across the board are going all out to target the youth vote. But what exactly does Young India want and which leader do they connect with the most? Ketki Angre has more. Another attempt to grab the attention of the youth. Also part of the grand old party's attempt to attract the young voter is the new focus on social media as new and younger faces are brought in. And the party's recent drubbing in the Delhi University elections is being closely studied since Delhi is viewed as a microcosm of India. The biggest chunk of eligible voters today falls in the category of 18 to 35 years. In fact, Election Commission estimates suggest 150 million this time around are first-time voters, a crucial constituency no political party can afford to ignore. The BJP has set a target of 10 million new members through a sustained membership drive. Already comfortable in the social media space, it aims to reach out to young voters through online interaction with its prime ministerial candidate. We consider them as a future and we are trying all the aspects, first through the people to people contact which will be done by our organization people, second through rallies, third through media and fourth through social media. The Amadmi party is offering a fresh set of leaders to youth impatient for change. We have a separate uh, student wing which is going to every college. They may be young and restless but today they are a powerful political constituency and they want to be heard. We will want to raise the voice and even recent things such as protests and all, then people want themselves to be heard. They don't want to be sitting at home and you know just watching the TV and oh, oh ye kaise ho gaya. But they want to be the change. They want to do something. They have an opinion about everything. So I think it's good that the young people that below 35, they take an initiative and vote. So I think it can actually change the outcome. The first time when we uh, practice a vote in our college, we felt that empowerment when we voted that yes, we brought so and so party, we brought so and so candidate to power, so, and we would exercise the same thing in the general elections also. In New Delhi, with Neha Khanna, Ketki Angre, Fendi TV. Well, joining us on the program tonight, we have Randeep Singh Surjewala, Cabinet Minister in the Haryana Government and Congress Leader. We have Vani Tripathi, spokesperson of the BJP uh, uh, and, and, and a prominent young leader from that party. We have Shivam Vich, journalist and blogger, joining us tonight from Delhi. And also with us, Mayank Gandhi, National Executive Member of the Aam Admi Party. Let me ask Shivam Vich first. You know, everyone's talking about how young people are going to play a big role in this election, Shivam. 47% of, of eligible voters will be below 35. And then the next question is, what exactly does Young India want? What do you think Young India wants? If I was to ask you that rather big generic you know, question. Uh, I think this young voter thing is a bit overestimated, overhyped every election. This is not the first election. Uh, I've actually in previous elections uh, asked in Uttar Pradesh, uh, Yadav voters, or Dalit voters, what do they want? Do they didn't think differently? And actually you'll be surprised how status quo is they t tend to be because they think of jobs, inflation, etc. And so they t t tend to think of um, identity politics, uh, so they, in fact, are more resistant to change than you would think. Um, and uh, it is the older voters who have, who maybe have loyalties to parties, but the younger voter thinks about employment, economy, inflation, th their prospects, their jobs, scholarships. Uh, and to that extent, they tend to be, uh, they, 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 they tend to vote more um, obviously than you would think. That's very interesting what you say because uh, it also adds up in a sense when, with, with when you look at the young leadership in this country. For example, right now, Akhilesh Yadav is under fire Absolutely. for his leadership Absolutely. in Uttar Pradesh. So does that reflect on the, the young leadership also? Uh, Absolutely. In Akhilesh is the best example. He was yeah. so overhyped, but he's proven to be just another uh, Samavadi party politician. Let me get Chetan Bhagat in, author Chetan Bhagat here in the studio with us. Do you agree with Shivam there or do you believe that young people in India today, let's talk about urban Indians in particular because, uh, in, in, because that's, that's one, one group and I'm sure rural Indians have different aspirations, but 
you know, he says they, they are, you know, into identity politics, their status quo, and we would be surprised by that. And yet others believe that this is a generation that's more aspirational, aggressive. Do you think that there's anything yeah. different? I think it is different. I, and I would include the rural also. I, whenever, whatever my limited experiences with villages is, uh, the, the term often uses zindagi mein kuch banna hai or you know I want to come up in life uh, often you might find that the rural youth would prefer his leader to be give him this aspirational but as well as be from his caste or her caste you know they they'll say you know but if he's from my caste and he can make me become something in life it's even better but it's so maybe it's in the rural ages the caste equations matter a little more in the more educated set it's it's more about coming up in life but the other thing which I know here is a tip for all the politicians contesting in 2014 which I think a lot of them are missing about the youth is personal freedom. The concept of personal freedoms is new in India and people are very scared, very very scared youth that some leader will come and say girls shouldn't wear jeans, they should not go out, Valentine's Day should not be celebrated, especially in, in certain parties where these kind of elements often thrive. So this is another big issue. Youth wants to come up in life, but they are also more broadly liberal. I mean, they don't want an India where there are restrictions on personal freedom. It's interesting you say that, I'm just going to take that back to Shivam briefly, because Shivam, you're saying the opposite. You're saying in a sense that, that, that they may be more regressive uh, than o older politicians were. Well, no, not more or less, but just the same. Uh, you know, for instance, really if you ask the question, do young voters prefer younger leaders? Do young voters prefer to vote for younger politicians? Now, that's not always true because they see in older politicians a greater sense of confidence and security. So, you will see um, uh, politicians like uh, Ajit Singh or Mulayam Singh still commanding a lot of rec uh, respect with, with their voters. Similarly, a uh, lot, lot of young voters might feel between Sonia and Rahul more comfortable with Sonia, more experienced. Uh, they do not necessarily identify with the young politicians. I think, I think all of this is just uh, media hype. I am going to take off on that and ask Randeep Surjewala that one would think that in the normal course uh, a 43 year old Rahul Gandhi would then uh, be the uh, in a sense the representative of this new India that everybody talks about rather than a 64 year old Narendra Modi and yet uh, survey after survey that you see for what they are worth will tell you that people are disconnected, young people are disconnected from what Rahul Gandhi has to say because they don't really understand what he's saying and, and would prefer Narendra Modi over him because he comes across as a more decisive leader with ideas that are very clear. What they may be. How would you respond to that criticism? Nidhi, there are two things. One, I disagree with Shivam and I seem to agree with Chetan when he says that the young in India are today aspirational. They want accountability. They want execution. They want delivery. Yes, they are impatient and aggressive, but they are also aspirational. They are forward looking. And as way, the whole debate about Mr. Narendra Modi and Sri Rahul Gandhi is concerned, what, has, uh, what is the vision for the youth that Mr. Narendra Modi has projected? I ask myself and I ask the young. And what is it that, what is it that Mr. Rahul Gandhi symbolizes? He said four things. A. Congress is ready to engage with the youth. B. Congress wants to be and he, he feels that the young in this country do not have as much voice as they need to have. C. They must have opportunity. And D. You must trust them. When you engage with them in politics or otherwise in social life, when you trust them, you give them opportunity, you give These them voice. These are Rahul voice. Gandhi's philosophy. Yeah, that okay. is the philosophy that Congress under Rahul Gandhi has projected. And we have implemented it in, in specific terms. We have given them right to education. We have given the young right to food. We have given the young right to work. We have given the but uh, young me, no, no, one second, right to question the government. That was for right everybody. But uh, let me ask you, for instance, the fact is that Rahul Gandhi, for example, was made in charge of the youth affairs of the party. And one of the things he actually kept talking about to journalists as well was that he wanted to end the dynastic tradition, the undemocratic traditions of the party. And that, that hasn't happened. And he's a prime product of that. I think the Indian Isn't youth that a huge failure? <coughs> no, I think the Indian Youth Congress and NSUI, and I've been president of the Indian Youth Congress for, for, for the longest time, it has seen a paradigm shift. When we speak about engagement of the young, he, Rahul Gandhi was the person who introduced a system of grassroots level election which is very difficult, impossible for any political party in this country to think of. He let millions and millions of new aspirational youth, nothing to do with politics, completely unconnected, professional, semi-professional, literate, illiterate, to come and have a say in the organization. Shivam, many of them are leaders. Then why Shivam. is he so unpopular? Now? Well, uh, Rahul Gandhi's efforts with the Youth Congress famously did not work. Uh, exactly the point they, they I was making.
it, no. they didn't and and why, did why is he so unpopular now I mean, especially among the educated set the it seems to be the more educated or the more resources a person in india gets the more they realize that i mean rahul is not popular in in our uh, the kind of segment nidhi is talking about today and you can say whatever but he is not popular in social media at all and that's millions of people but he is not on social media and yeah. i just want to before i get to vani because i know that that will then become a modi versus rahul yeah, debate i want that, to ask yeah. jay, jay panda uh, because jay you know the fact that narendra modi you know is on twitter you know he 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 has attended a, a, lo a lot of uh, uh, you know colleges he's gone to colleges he's he's met students uh, and what is it about his personality you think that young educated indians find appealing in your view keeping your politics aside for a moment well let's put aside let's put aside uh, their activity on social media or their age for a moment i want to remind you of an old saying about leadership and this is true of the aspirational young indians who are today going to be voting what the, the saying is that people want to see somebody who leads or follows or gets out of the way and i think on that count there is a clear difference between these two leaders that you are talking about on the one hand you have somebody who's very ambivalent and on the other hand somebody who's not shy at all about wanting to take the lead but i also want to point out that uh, you must realize that there are also other leaders at regional levels throughout the country because it is not a uniform country there are there are big differences and variances uh, and i don't think we have come yet to a point of uh, of a rahul gandhi versus narendra modi kind of uh, a discussion at the national level except in the media of course i'll take this question to vani well nidhi to begin with i think let's look at the ambit of this you know debate it is not just about populism versus what is the question mark it's also about a perceptive reality which is rhetoric versus good governance and when i say that it is not just a social media space look at what modi ji has been doing in the past couple of months whether it was hyderabad whether it was the srcc debate whether whatever is happening uh, you know over the past few months the story playing out is one person is parachuting into dalit homes and doing nothing about it whether it was mrs kala and so on or whatever is happening now not just the ambivalence also the fact that there is no deliverance mechanism also playing the outsider card we are just saying that uh, as mr surjewala said and i quote that he said that you know he wants to do such so many things for the youth and right for right to food how can you be an outsider when you've been in a government uh, for 10 years in more than 10 states of the country you've been in governance and yet the big question mark is what is your vision for the youth uh, visibly that there is a comparative analysis of what uh, the vision for the youth narendra modi has or the bjp has so it is it is a unequal comparison rather it's not a comparison at all there is a deliverance mechanism that you've seen the story play out in terms of how he has been as a leader and as uh, mr bhagat just said not just willingness to lead also willingness to lead for improvement and for development with conscience you know, the criticism the criticism then about mr modi would be that th there are a lot of young people in this country who just want quick fix solutions to everything whether it's on terrorism whether it's on the economy and that mr modi promises you know a lot of things and they might you know maybe high on rhetoric more uh, but nidhi they are high on rhetoric i mean you've seen gujarat also has a very large number of young voters which came out you know for the third time and voted for him but having said that that's not the only reality you're faced with what are you faced with you're faced with with a leader who believes in governance and who's shown it and another leader who's just a reluctant god knows what is he reluctant to govern is he reluctant for so commitment me. is he commitment phobic and See, just one last thing he is commitment phobic he is commitment phobic and social media today is a space which is not a blank space for example if i tweet about going on your show in 30 seconds i have 30 opinions and those op opinions are fantastic most of them i'm going to talk about i'm going to talk about they are they are just just about okay. Okay. just one comment though i mean yeah. i agree they want development they want aspiration they want freedom but we are assuming that they are very politically aware and they know whether to choose between rahul or narendra modi i would say either party not to get very smug at this point they want this change but they are politically apart from a small small segment of the youth they are politically ambivalent they don't know what's going on they they kind of know about some scams that happened they don't really even know who did the scams and i unfortunately if the youth are you underestimating i if the youth in this country really wanted change if they really wanted change it would have happened by now because the youth has been sleeping because they didn't vote because they didn't know what's going on 
uh, is this why is part of the reason why the country is in the way it is uh, why is the education system so terrible for our youngsters over here we we talk about grants and all but we all we can have a discussion here everybody will admit that the education system or the employment opportunities at a mass level are not there why because the youth don't count they don't count but because they would have we to, have we don't they know they would have to count in this so election is because they just form a huge no, they, they should part count. Of the no, party wants to come in. So at the same, I, I want to tell the young people listening that both parties are going to say, listen, yeah, our leader is great, our leader is great. Maybe they are both great. But at the same time, these people have to make an informed choice and who can lead India. On one hand, you're saying that Mr. Modi has not many... not capable of making an informed no, choice. Mr. Modi is not known. I, I, I can tell you right now, he is not known in the South, for example. He is not known in the North. No, East. no, that's not true. I mean, you saw what happened in Hyderabad. I the argument is, why, I mean, how can, you build up, how can you build up on the argument and say the youth doesn't know? 16 December, the youth was there, uh, you know, amongst the winter, the water, 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 No, I mean, the point is, you will know you have an election which is coming, also exactly, six state elections. So why rubbish an idea which is already bursting okay, at the seams as, as, as far as the, the social media yes. space is concerned? Nidhi, uh, we have to look at it like this. There is the personal lust for power and there is a yearning desire to change, which is the one that the young will choose. Here is a person in Mr. Rahul Gandhi who says, yes, it is important to be in power, but it is far more important to give the voice and people of this country voice, opportunity, trust. You, can, right you can do that when you is take a position. The right power? to engage. I mean, is but he giving up power? Is, he, is the family giving up power? Is but the, talking about Dalits and eating it, food in their no, homes is engagement. And if it was engagement, did we see the youth? Did we see, did we see him do something for the youth? What, what is, is the vision for the youth, Mr. Sikhara? The country really wants to know. No, 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 the country wants to know. The nation wants to know. The nation wants to know. I have to say that. What is the vision for the youth? I've told him that tonight. But come on, let me, I, I, we don't, we just talked about yesterday as well. I think you guys need I, I, we know where you guys stand. I think you guys need to have a proper no. debate and educate the youngsters watching the show on how they can be politically engaged and how they should choose a leader. But isn't it important for Rahul Gandhi then to take on a position of responsibility? Why rubbish the Prime Minister's post as the Congress spokesperson did two days ago? These are small things for Rahul Gandhi. We talked about this yesterday as well on the program. Why are they small things? The Does the Prime Minister not help empower people? The isn't office? that what he should do? No, no, I, do? Do, I don't think so. It's, it should not be taken in that sense. The office of the Prime Minister is the supreme office in this country but there are things you can be a change agent without being even the prime minister and who says but he, he would not be but who is in power is that Mohan Singh ji in power or Sonia Gandhi in power let me ask let, let me ask my power not being important let, let please let answer this question is Sonia Gandhi in power or Manmohan Singh in power Chetan, the, we I, have I a want setup. To, we have an answer I know the setup but you, what is the answer if you will let me give the answer then, I'll, then hmm. only you will get one Prime Minister is Dr. Manmohan Singh. We have a beautiful governance mechanism and a delivery mechanism inside the party. It's lovely. And but she, is the president of, she is the chairperson of the UP. But who is more powerful? And it's a cumulative, it's a cumulative leadership that but runs who is this more country. Powerful? And that's why we, we voted in power twice. But it's no, the family the of Manmohan Singh. This country, this country, this country, this country, this country we, we have a leader and they do not know whether they have a leader. This country has proved by voting us to power. Let me get Mayank in because he's been listening patiently. Mayank, one of the interesting things about the Aam Admi Party's campaign, especially here in Delhi, has been this attempt to really reach out to young voters. Just tell us some of the things you feel uh, it could, could be game changers as far as young voters are concerned, particularly here in Delhi. See, uh, just a couple of things I just wanted to sure. say. If people were saying that the youth want status quo, they would not have come out in such large numbers for the Anna movement and also now supporting the Aam Admi movement. Our party is basically a youth driven party. Our leader himself has done so much and left his job and he is a young guy. So, and what, what is the alternative? The other parties all have youngsters who have a surname. Do you know of any big leader who does not have a surname, who is young? All of them are children of some kind of leader. So, what essentially uh, Aam Admi Party is trying to offer to the youth of this country is a different political culture. A culture where the accounts are open, transparent, a process in which People will shun power once they come, they will not have a VIP culture, they will not take bungalows, they will, they will, I mean you are taking away the perks of power which is being used and the youth are completely disgusted with the way the VIP culture, the monarchs have come in, the kings are all right now in power. We don't want a king, we want a person who is our trustee, who is our representative. Today the entire political culture has become one and the youth don't like that and that is that once they go to power they become kings and we are all servile. So we need to change 
the public servant needs to again become the servant of the public. And Aam Admi Party is talking that language. It is putting in processes. It is all his money is open, transparent. And it is talking a political culture with the youth wants to listen. Which is why the youth is getting engaged with this new kind of a thought process. For the first time, it seems possible that truth can prevail in elections. And the kind of opinion polls that is coming in Delhi, it seems that something strange is going to happen to this country. And you can win with truth. You can win using the right processes. And you don't need to use money, muscles and divisive agendas to win elections. So it's a completely different thought process which is being offered and the youth are lapping it up. And Arvind Kejriwal, the kind of leadership that he is giving and this daring to open up scandals of Robert Vadra or whether Nitin Gadkari, across the board, all the corrupts are taken and we are coming out with a positive Lok Ayukta Lokpal bill which is going to change the way governance takes place. You know, there's, an interesting, really there's an interesting you point, a point that you made on agendas in particular and at a time, you know, when we're going through this uh, this entire debate on secularism and communalism and what are the issues that this country is going to face in the elections. I do wonder how young people today look at the kind of deliberate polarization that's done across party lines in this country, across states. But before I come to that, Jay Panda, how important is but communication? I, I just want to no, one second, man. Yeah, how important is co communication? Yeah, okay, Bank, I'll just come back to you. Jay, how important is communication, yeah. especially among young leaders? And there again, you see a contrast where you have a Rahul Gandhi who doesn't communicate, forget social media, I'm thinking who doesn't communicate, who doesn't speak, who's, who's, we don't know what he thinks on, on key issues. How important is it for this generation to see leaders speak, uh, speak to the press, speak to them at rallies, at colleges? How important is all of that? Look, it's, it's bizarre for anybody in politics to be uh, not accessible to the media, not accessible to the public. Because politics is, is entirely about that, is entirely about engaging with the public um, quite a lot through the media and communicating. Just the other day, I, I read a news item about the Congress party recruiting a large number of spokespersons. But then if the top three leaders of the party are usually not accessible to the media, it sends a message to all these spokespersons that you must do as I say, not as I do. And so there is a disconnect uh, in the communication strategy of the party. Uh, leaders should not expect their rank and file to be, to be doing things that they themselves are not prepared to do. So of course it is important. Uh, you know, there, there's no two ways about that. And, on, and social media on which you are so active yourself, Jay, you know, you had also written about the fact that you believe that it, there is an important impact that social media will have, but you don't think this election will necessarily be it. I think, uh, let me repeat what I have said before, I think in this election social media or, or politicians on social media will make a mark. I think it will be a significant tool, but I don't think it's the game changer that some people are making it out to be this election. Because at best, I think there will be about 200 million Indians on any kind of internet connection. Most of them will not be broadband. Most of them will not be on social media like Twitter or Facebook. But I think one or at most two elections down the road, we are looking at social media being a game changer for politics. I think it can level the playing field for new candidates who may not have a family background, who may not have a party infrastructure to back them up, but they can mobilize people, they can mobilize voters using this communication tool. Let me take that to Shivam. Shivam, how important, one, is communication at every level that we were talking about earlier and then uh, uh, being, being on Twitter and Facebook? You know, it works both ways actually. Uh, if Rahul Gandhi, Sonia Gandhi, Manmohan Singh were to communicate even through uh, uh, TV uh, or the press, uh, what they say would come on social media, would be discussed there, would be taken forward there but they don't communicate. So one is communication no matter what the channel be. Two, what social media does is, you know, uh, I agree with Jay Panda that only 200 million people have access to internet, but even those who do not have access to internet, their agendas are being affected by social media indirectly. Because even the mainstream media takes very seriously what social media is discussing, it spreads through word of, word of mouth. Uh, so there's a ripple effect of what goes viral on social media. Uh, I mean, even those who are not on social media know what Feku and Papu is and those are terms that emerged on social media. So the all round effect on uh, communication, on political communication uh, for which we cannot underestimate social media and at the same time we cannot overestimate it. Um, what, is, what is happening these days is that 
you begin something with Twitter and then even NDTV has to take it seriously rather than the other way around. So I think something very complex is happening here with political communication. Very interesting there. I'll take that to Chetan, you know, on, on this point of communication. Although I have no, to say I that when I told my dad about, about Feku the other day and Papu, he just stared at me like, what are you talking about here? Yeah, I think it's important. I think that's the one single weakness. I think it served the Congress very well in the past that, uh, you know, let's keep our top leadership separate and they are going to not answer everyday issues. But it's a different world today, especially as far as public opinion is concerned. And wherever it, people are aware that they don't talk, uh, I think it, it leads to some uh, you know, displeasure or something. Having said that, this segment of people who have these kind of views is still very small. I mean, at the end of the day, Mr. Rahul Gandhi knows that there are a lot of poor people in the country and he's targeting those people. It's, it's becoming a class election in some ways. And I think it's a, when it comes to politics, you, you got, he, he's doing what he thinks is best to win and he has I think decided uh, that this NDTV watching class is not going to give me as, listen to me as much as I want to so let me go to the bigger masses and they will vote me into power and that is the strategy they have used in fact a few days back he said that, that they are elitists whereas yeah, yeah, you know it's a, it's a which it didn't really have much basis but you know it, it, it's that's how he's trying to project it and I think don't underestimate the Congress, you know, they, they know how to win elections but and you no, must no. learn something from them. If it was such a big issue, they would have been all over it. But I think their call and I would be interested to know that what do they really think about all this natak that happens on social media and the English news channels and night. It's very interesting and nice, but does it matter in politics, you think? See, I, I seem to completely disagree with Chetan. Mm -hmm. If you consider poverty in this country, unemployment in this country, if you consider lack of education in this country to be a natak of the poor, then I would probably side on the side of the poor. No, because I'm, saying saying the NDTV is the I'm saying the NDTV, I'm saying the opposite. He's saying Did TV channels, social media. I said all this yeah. natak of Twitter, NDTV, all the With other channels. Regards, Chetan also said that we have a, it's a class war happening and we have a constituency identified and we are only catering to a constituency. That's completely unfair. The truth is, that for large part of those 24 crore Indians who are between 15 to 24, 60 crore Indians who are below 25, the median age in this country being 25, roti, kapda, makan, rojgar, employment, opportunity, voice are the most relevant thing. So it's not about communication alone, Nidhi. It's also but about... communication is important. Communication is extremely important. But more important is sincerity of purpose. More important is no, the idea you, that... How do, you trans, how do we see that sincerity of purpose? And I'll just give you one example that struck a chord with all of us. When you had those anti-rape protests in Delhi in December, and we were all out there, someone like Rahul Gandhi, who is an allegedly a young leader, if he had just come out and talked to those protesters, and, and, and just said something. Do you know how much of a difference that would have made? But don't you think or, or any of the other young uh, members of parliament. We saw nobody. But can I intervene and say, don't you think so that the young in this country, including Mr. Rahul Gandhi, did? And see, ultimately, right. what is the result of what happened? The whole change movement that happened post Nirbhya case resulted into the Indian National Congress ensuring through Justice Verma Committee's report a new law that people wanted. But so the point did we is not rise up is, to the that, expectations that is of the level of engagement we are talking about. That is what was lacking. And in fact, I was very much there, though quietly in personal capacity. And every day they say, Desh ka yuva yaha hai, Rahul Gandhi tu kaha hai. This is one slogan I heard every day from all the youngsters who were water cannon, lati charge, it was 5 degrees and so on. But they were so resilient and so insistent on being there. And imagine boys, not just girls, we always look at women issues and we think this is just about women, it's just about girls. But I just want to ask you, know? is there a dangerous the BJP's case of over communication by Mr. Modi? See, right he, now he's everywhere. No, no, no. When you talk about engagement, you have to look at levels of engagement and we are just, why are we just talking about Facebook and Twitter? Remember the Google no, handout? He's about TV also. He, he is everywhere. So is there a danger no, no, I think over exposed. the more engagement required so we actually know what the country is thinking, what the youth is thinking. There's been 10 years of absolute silence where we, we've had no conversation between the governing class and what the youth thinks. Now that somebody is trying to engage, I think that should be very welcome. And all, all, all the more the reason that we need to hear these voices in terms of communicative more modes of doing politics. Politics is not just about sloganeering and electioneering and Zindabad, Murdabad. It's so much about also... But I want to ask Mayank Gandhi on this, on this point that Chetan Bhagat was making about, you know, 
uh, and, and I said that at the beginning as, as well, young urban Indians are different and, and what young rural Indians want may be very different. Do you believe uh, that uh, you know, those aspirations are being looked at very differently by certain parties? See, we have been travelling in the rural areas also and because of the television, Arvind Kejriwal and Aam Admi Party and Anna Azar and all of them have reached them and they feel that there is certain change that is taking place and they and they they believe in that. So I am not really feeling that the impulse for change is different in urban and in rural. There may be difference in perception, difference in uh, but everyone, nobody wants status quo. A country in which 40 crore people sleep hungry, obviously the youth want, uh, does not want status quo. For somebody to say that the youth also wants to go with the status quo, I think is an is a assumption which is ridiculous. Jay Panda, last comments, last comments from everyone tonight. Jay, to you first. It, what do you think then are, are the issues that young people would want to focus on in this election? And you know, we're seeing all kinds of strange things happening as, as we come closer to the general election. This politics of polarization in particular has been very worrying. How do you think young people would look at this? Well, I want to repeat that India is a very large country and with so many languages and so many subcultures, I, I don't think we have uh, a single situation throughout the country. So, uh, you know, at, if you look across the country, I think there may be a dozen issues, but there are some issues that do have resonance across regions. Governance is definitely one of them. I think it is not just the youth, but I think uh, large numbers of our voters today have recognized that governance can actually happen in a democracy which is why we have overturned the earlier situation where we used to have anti-incumbency and an incumbent government was sure to lose whereas in the last decade and a half those governments at the state level which have been performing have been getting rewarded by getting re-elected so I think that's one theme that runs across uh, there are of course certain regional issues uh, polarization is an issue that doesn't uh, resonate everywhere in the country uh, but clearly I agree with some of the sentiments that have been uh, stated today which is that nobody wants the status quo. They want to see uh, India that's more vibrant and delivers to their aspirations whether they are young or old. Shivam, how do you see that? Uh, you know, it, since it, I it, use it, the word status yeah. quo, I must clarify, I didn't mean to say that the youth are uh, uh, pro the current government or they think the current government is great. What I meant to say is that the issues, Ideas. the youth are no different from the issues for people older than them, be it corruption, caste, communalism, identity politics, development, governance. Uh, you know, this aspirational word is being overused here because it's not as the, el the elderly people don't want the economy to do well or they don't want uh, their children to get jobs and have cars and buy houses. So I think the difference between youth and elderly, they would, they, the issues that matter to them is very little. Is, okay, very little. Interesting point. Chetan, what yeah. would you say to that? I think the youth needs to be overall more engaged. I think the choices here, I mean, uh, whether it's AAP, Congress, BJP, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. Their leaders have their strengths and weaknesses. But the youth, although it wants all these things, there is no sense of greater good yet. There is no sense. It's all for myself. And, and rightly so because it's such a struggle becoming anything in this country but it's the, the concept that there is a greater good and we are part of something and I have to contribute my bit to the system to change it along with develop my own life that concept is not there they want all these things but they want it for themselves and it's a it's, it's little selfish and that is why Do you think many of them will not vote? I hope, I hope uh, they vote I hope they vote and they don't just vote like just on hearsay, they, they in get involved, they hear all arguments and they vote properly because it is their country. Ultimately, all these people here are looking for one thing only, no better India. What is Congress? What is BJP? You all have Indian passport only. So, I think it's the youth that needs to demand things out of these leaders. If you want Rahul Gandhi to talk, say we want Rahul Gandhi to talk. If you want Mr. Modi to uh, do something, you tell him to do something or something like that. But I think it is coming down to democracy means power with the people. These people are sitting here because someone decided that they need to sit here. And I think that's what my, the my election what's time your, What's your feedback in Delhi in particular? Do you get a sense that there will be more involvement? Delhi, I like Mumbai, is famous for its middle class actually not coming out to vote. And that I think is irrespective of what age they are. But do you think really, do you really believe that younger people would come out in larger numbers this time? This time, I... I mean, I have been in Delhi and I have stayed for a while. 
I think I am in the midst of a revolution. Look at the, I mean, people, youngsters are coming, they stop us, they tell us we are with you, we want to vote, they try to bring in people. So, what is happening till now is the other uh, traditional political parties have been humoring youth and saying we will work for you, we will do something. And I think the youth are smarter than all of us put together. It is time that youth come and take over the leadership rather than follow the leadership. It is the youth who have to come on the munch and we are the people who have to sit down because the youth of today are ready for taking leadership and that's what we think that will happen in Delhi. All right, I'm going to leave it at that. That's all I have time for tonight. But it's been fascinating to talk to all of you about what uh, what young Indians think and uh, perhaps want. Let's just see whether those young Indians who who say they want a lot of things do actually come out and cast their vote when the polls come up first in the assembly and then in the general election. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us tonight. We'll take a break. When we come back, the day's other big top stories. Do stay with us. Welcome back and now an NDTV exclusive, a new row over India's nuclear liability law is about to break out. NDTV has learned that ahead of the Prime Minister's visit to the United States next week, where an important move forward on the India-US nuclear deal is likely, the Attorney General of India has given an opinion to the government, which the government now has, which basically says that the liability of a supplier in case of an accident, that is a foreign supplier in case of a nuclear accident, can be limited or waived off by the operator, which in India's case would be the government of India. A hugely, hugely controversial issue because India's nuclear liability law, if you remember, had become a big political issue in parliament and had ensured that foreign suppliers would also be liable if there is an accident. My colleague Sunil Prabhu has the news on that breaking story. Sunil. That's right, uh, Niti. As you rightly said, it was a huge controversial clause, uh, the right to recourse. It's the clause 17 of the nuclear liability bill. And uh, now, of course, the Attorney General says uh, quite clearly that if the operator, that is India's only uh, op nuclear operator, the nuclear power corporation of India, if it decides to have a deal either with the Americans or for the Russians or for that matter the French and does not get into an agreement with them uh, on, the, on the clause of liability or the right to recourse, then it will, they will not be held liable and they can get away scot-free. And that, of course, has become a big bone of contention. And as you said, in a run-up to the Prime Minister's visit, they asked the opinion of the Attorney General. And I think the most important point that the Americans want is to limit the liability clause uh, so as to ensure that they are not uh, charged a huge amount of uh, money in case of a manufacturing defect or in case of a mishap. And that, of course, has become clear that uh, the Government of India has got that go-ahead from the Attorney General. Of course, this is a huge political hot potato because not only the left parties but the BJP and cutting across uh, uh, all parties they had agreed uh, that uh, there has to be a right to recourse and anybody who is responsible for any mishap uh, cannot get away uh, but now of course with this new opinion and as the Attorney General him himself says this is a matter of uh, law I am not commenting on the policy uh, per se uh, but definitely uh, this is in the run up to the uh, uh, Prime Minister's visit where a draft cabinet note is being prepared where India plans to have a special works agreement with White Westinghouse uh, for a nuclear uh, uh, project which is called the due diligence report for nearly 550 crores. Right. They want to indemnify uh, the nuclear power co corporation uh, for life. Uh, these are big questions and big uh, uh, question marks that are being raised and hopefully uh, finally there will be some clarity as that cabinet note is prepared and taken to the Prime Minister. Well, do expect uh, uh, fierce political reactions to that from the BJP and the left in particular. We are following up on that. Sunil, thanks very much for that news break tonight. That's it on Left, Right and Centre this evening. We'll see you all again tomorrow with more on what's happening in Muzaffarnagar and Uttar Pradesh that continues to be an extremely important story. See you then. Goodbye.